how do you convince someone to pay you $100 for a 50 cent coin? There is a scene in Better Call Saul that shows you exactly how to do it, and the technique can be summed up in one sentence. You can't scam an honest person. This scam is carried out by two accomplices, Jimmy and Marco, and they start by finding a target who we'll call Michael. For this particular scam to work, Michael must have a certain psychological profile, but we'll talk about this later. The second condition is that he must have at least $100 in his wallet, which will soon be exchanged for the 50 cent coin. The third is that he must not already know the scammers. Is he a regular? No. The scammers begin by setting up a simple scenario. Jimmy wants to sell a coin to Marco. All I'm asking is that you take a look. I'm sorry, buddy. No offense. I'm just, you know, I'm not interested. Notice that Michael is not initially involved. And this is essential. Because if someone tried to sell him a coin in some shady bar, he would be immediately suspicious. Instead, Michael is treated to a nice little performance, which is designed to attract his curiosity and also to establish assumptions about the two companions. Boom. Okay. You see it? I see a Kennedy half dollar. Jimmy takes out a 50 cent coin with a portrait of Kennedy. But it's not just any old coin. Which way is he facing? JFK is facing left. <laughs> exactly. Hey, which way is he supposed to be facing? Right. He's supposed to be facing right. Okay, so why, why is this one facing left? At this point, Michael's curiosity is well and truly aroused. He suspects that there is a scam somewhere, but he's not sure yet what it is. And Jimmy boosts his initial curiosity by telling a little story. November 22nd, 1963, Kennedy is assassinated, right? The whole nation goes into mourning. They start naming everything in sight after. The story goes like this. Following Kennedy's assassination, America pays tribute to him in all sorts of ways, including minting 50 cent coins in his likeness. According to Jimmy, the presidents on the coins traditionally face right, because that's the direction the sun rises. That's why pretty much every grave everywhere faces east, you know, so the spirit of the dead person faces the rising sun, you know, it's a death thing, it's a burial thing. But an employee at the mint disagrees with his choice, and without telling anyone, one day, he changes the machines to strike coins with Kennedy looking left. Soon, the switcheroo is discovered. The employee is fired and most of the coins are recovered, but not all of them. And they managed to get most of them back, melt them down, but there's still 200 plus floating around out there. At this point, Jimmy has firmly captured Michael's attention. Michael immediately guesses it's a low-level scam, but he's dying to see what's gonna happen next. By the way, the scam is supposed to seem so obvious to Michael because it flatters his sense of superiority. Of course, he thinks, I would never fall for such a cheap scam. Those two rednecks really make me laugh. What's that? I didn't catch that. I didn't say anything. You mind, buddy? We're having a private conversation here. When Michael tries to get involved in the conversation, he's immediately rejected. And this is a pattern we're gonna see throughout the entire scene. There are two reasons for this. The first is that it confirms to Michael that he is not the target of the scam, so he has no reason to be suspicious, and his subconscious mind is not raising any red flags. He feels like a detached observer, but he's not going to stay that way for long, because rejecting Michael also serves to plant the seeds of loss aversion in his mind, which will be activated later. Jimmy goes on to explain the deal. This one's not in perfect condition, but on the open market I'd say it's worth Six or eight hundred bucks. Eight hundred dollars? Yeah, I'm hard up, so I'll take uh, one hundred dollars for it. You want me to give you a hundred dollars for a half dollar? I want you to give me a hundred dollars for an eight hundred dollar coin. One hundred dollars for a coin worth eight hundred is a good deal. In fact, it's too good to be true. Marco is naturally skeptical, and with these words, Jimmy goes to the bathroom. After he leaves, the scam enters its third step. This guy's playing me, right? Definitely. This simple two-sentence dialogue is brilliant for two reasons. First, Marco validates Michael's sense of superiority. Marco is a good guy, but a bit dim-witted and needs to seek advice on an offer that is an obvious scam. And why does he ask Michael for advice? Because Michael is clearly a smart guy. 
As you can tell by his suit and tie, his sarcastic grin, and especially by the fact that he's writing with a font and pen in his little notebook. Of course, this also serves to confirm to Michael himself that he's much smarter than those two rednecks and is at no risk of being ripped off by such idiots. The second reason is that this exchange puts Marco and Michael on the same side. This is rule number one if you want to change someone's way of thinking. First, show that you are starting from the same belief. You know what? I know this guy on Wabash, coin dealer in front of my uncles. Hey Joey, I use your phone, local call. Marco announces that he'll confirm their common belief by calling an expert in vintage coins. I'm gonna call this guy, and when he tells me this is a scam, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call the cops and get this scumbag thrown in the can. You're my witness, okay? Slowly but surely, Michael finds himself drawn deeper into the situation. At first, he was just a curious spectator of a goofy scam. Then, he became a wise advisor, and now he finds himself as a potential witness as well. Yeah, that's in Denver. <sighs> Jesus, I'm no kidding. Well, listen, I gotta go, all right? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I owe you one. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. Notice the body language in this sequence. Marco turns his back on Michael and excludes him again from the conversation, which activates his fear of loss. And on the other hand, we see Michael starting to really pay attention to what is going on. He's involved, he wants to know, but... So what do you say? Yeah, you know, he, he didn't really know much. Marco has clearly found out something but he doesn't want to say what. This is calculated to convey to Michael the idea that the coin is actually valuable without telling him directly, which would arouse his suspicion. Michael feels like he has uncovered a secret, some information that Marco is withholding. And now it's time to speed things up. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $50 for it. $50? I'm taking a bath at $100. All right, okay, look, I got $64 right here. It's an $800 coin. Okay, I'm not gonna sell it to you for $64. Okay, if you wait for me, I'll get you 100 bucks. I don't know. This discussion creates a sense of urgency as the deal is about to take place. At this point, Michael has several bits of information. Number one, Jimmy wants to sell a coin for $100. Number two, Jimmy says the coin is worth $800. Number three, a neutral expert has confirmed the coin's value. Number four, Marco is about to buy the coin. Michael concludes that he can buy the coin himself and make a nice profit. But he's missing the most important piece of information. Number five, Marco and Jimmy are working together. However, he doesn't have time to think about it because three psychological forces are working on him at the same time. Urgency, because the deal is about to go through without him. Loss aversion, because the opportunity will never come again. And his own sense of superiority, because he is up against two rednecks who are not smart enough to scam someone like him. Besides, Michael feels like he deserves to come out the winner of this whole exchange, not that dumb fat Marco. And these three forces are enough to make him jump into action. Hey buddy, I got 75 bucks right here. I, I, sorry, I need a hundred. Hey Slick, nobody's talking to you, mind your own business, okay? Again, the rejection of his bid confirms that this is not a scam and further activates Michael's loss aversion. An auction situation is a well-known way to increase urgency. Cash money, $80. Look, if you give me a chance, I'll be back with a hundred dollars. How long will that be? I don't know. I gotta catch a train, come back. Hour, yeah, hour, you know, and a half. This guy was most. getting ready to call no, cops on you. I what? was not. The urgency increases, and with it, Michael's involvement, who starts to snitch on Marco. Now he really wants the coin. His desire is irrational and driven by the urgency of the situation. Why would you do that? Now this guy is making shit up. The tension is at its peak. Michael's veins are filled with adrenaline. Any form of critical thinking has disappeared. I got 110 right here. Sold. No, 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 no. no this no, guy's no. got the cash. No. Don't do care, that. Take care of that. It's history right there. Hey, you can't do that. Hey, money talks. You're lost. It's over. No, it's not over. No, it's crap. It's crucial to understand that a scam like this is not just about money. It's mostly about ego. All along, the accomplices have allowed Michael to feel superior. And now, Michael confirms this assumption by behaving as a sore loser. Hey, where do you think you're going, hey, huh? Back off, dude. Yeah, back off when you give me the JFK back. Hey, Joey, call the cop. The final touch of genius is that in this scam, it's Michael who runs away. It would have been suspicious if the accomplices had slipped away right after the transaction, but they don't have to. Michael sees Marco becoming agitated, trying to physically block him and threatening to call the police. And he knows he has to leave now or he might get cornered. You come back in here and your ass is grass. I got friends, buddy. 
You hear me? You double dealing bastard! I got friends! <laughs> you are so beautiful! <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody! Next round's on us! To sum up, there are three psychological forces at work here. The first being the secret. Here is the full version of the quote I mentioned at the start of the video. It's from a book by marketing legend John Carlton. Savvy street hustlers know something most civilians do not. You can't con an honest man. You need two critical ingredients in the mix. Number one, greed, which is easily understandable. And number two, secrets, which is less understood. Greed gets the mark hooked. His thinking is gonna make a killing or pull one over on someone. But it's the secret he carries. The thought that is operating almost sociopathically for a change. And feeling damned superior because of it. That cooks the con game. We're all looking for a shortcut. We all want to feel superior to others. We all dream of learning a secret which will allow us to get the upper hand over others for once. Let's take the example of another scam featured in the show where Jimmy and his mark find a Rolex. It's, I don't know, it's, well, then, let me look at it. It's a damn Rolex. Uh, I don't know. Not cool to be greedy, bro. Uh, I don't, I, not cool. This scam revolves around Jimmy pretending not to know the value of the watch and thinking it's worth $3,000, when his mark knows it's worth at least $10,000. What do you know about that thing? I mean, is it worth more than three? It is this feeling of superiority that will lead the mark to pay $580 for a counterfeit watch. Later, sucker! The second psychological force at work is the principle of congruency. Starting a conversation with a stranger in public is not easy, and they will quickly become suspicious if you have something to sell. The solution is counterintuitive. You have to get the mark to come to you by making him work to get into the conversation. Once he makes an effort to initiate the dialogue, the principle of congruency will naturally lead him to keep going asking you questions and getting more and more involved in the narrative you're setting up. For example, later in the show, Jimmy approaches a trader in a bar and as usual, he plays on his sense of superiority by asking a dumb question. Hey buddy, could you settle a bet for us? A what? Uh, sorry, I don't want to make it sound like I was eavesdropping, but I kind of was. Uh, we heard you talking about stocks. Then he pretends to leave, so it's a mark who has to keep the conversation going. And it's a smart move, too. Sticking it all in the bank. Um, no. Yeah, you can invest all your money. Just make sure you diversify. Jimmy knows the fish is hooked when he starts asking questions. Now, if I had an idea of the money we're talking about, ballpark, I could give you examples of smart diversification. Ultimately, there is nothing more effective in shutting down the rational part of your Mark's brain than to combine his greed with the aversion to loss. That is to say, the risk that this unique opportunity will be lost forever. Later on in the show, Jimmy meets a rich guy who sees himself as a potential investor. Once again, the situation is set up so that the mark is the one asking the questions. So Giselle was telling me you two are starting a business. What exactly did she tell you? Oh, nothing much, just something about a app. Dot com, some way for people to hook up with each other using the internet? And of course, the opportunity is no longer available, which makes it all the more desirable. We're full up on this oh, thing. Okay. We sign one more investor, we gotta go public. And I'm just, no. <laughs> we cannot take anyone else on. No offense. And so, as soon as an investment slot opens up by a stroke of luck, the investor is rushing to write a check for $10,000. If you liked the video, subscribe. Next week, I'll show you why Tesla is the biggest marketing heist of the 21st century.